Um, and so our next presentation is what to expect when you're expecting cancer treatment. So our speakers had a little bit of fun with that presentation title, um, but I don't want to diminish the great advice that they're going to be giving um, in their session. So we have three nurses, um, oncology nurses, who are going to provide insights regarding the patient's experience, which be, will be especially helpful for those of you in the audience who are newly diagnosed or if you're caregivers um, for those who are newly diagnosed. All right, so our first speaker is Alexis uh, Volpentesta. And she is currently working as a registered nurse in the Radiation Oncology Department at the Larry Cancer Center. Um, so Alexis graduated from Trinity Christian College with a Bachelor of Science in Nursing uh, degree. And then she went on to become an oncology certified nurse. And so she has over six years of experience working specifically in the oncology field. And so she is also pursuing an advanced degree and she is uh, currently enroll enrolled at North Park University and will graduate in May uh, with a master's degree in nursing and will be a family nurse practitioner. So that's super exciting. Um, so welcome Alexis. Thank you so much for sharing your time and uh, we look forward to your presentation. Yeah. Hi everyone. Thank you for joining me today. I have been working at Northwestern for about six years, um, specifically in the radiation oncology department. So my focus tonight will be talking to you about what to expect when you um, kind of get the phone call that you may be needing radiation therapy. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. So some objectives that I wanna go over today is to define radiation therapy, the list the goals of radiation therapy and discuss side effects and supportive care of cancer treatments. So what to expect. Um, at the beginning of the patient's cancer journey, the patient usually presents to the ER or their primary care physician with a chief complaint. After further workup of MRI, CT scans, PET scans, biopsies, um, a cancer diagnosis is established. Patient care, um, patients are referred to the appropriate discipline to establish a plan of care, and patients are referred to radiation oncology from either surgical oncology or medical oncology. And I do want to just pause and take the time to say, um, you know, I'm sorry that, you know, this diagnosis has occurred. This is the hardest part of treatment. I always tell my patients when I meet them and consult, the beginning of treatment is the absolute hardest when you are being referred from one discipline to the other, whether it be surgery, medical oncology, talking about chemo or immunotherapy, and then being told that you need MRIs, PET scans, biopsies, and then um, eventually told that you'll probably need radiation therapy. So just know that it is, it is overwhelming. It is okay to feel overwhelmed. And as the journey progresses, it, it does get a bit easier. You build relationships with the nurses and with the physicians, and everyone is a, a real big support system for you. So um, just, just know that. So as we move on, um, like I said, I primarily work within radiation oncology, but have experience within the medical oncology side as well. Um, we will discuss both in simple detail as the processes are quite similar and we are all one big team. And that's a picture of us with a patient and his baby in front of the celebration gong um, that patients hit on their last day. So in general, what is radiation? Radiation uses the high energy particles or waves to destroy or damage cancer cells. Um, the unit that we describe radiation in is known as gray or centigrade. It's kind of like milligrams um, in the medical world. So that's our dose and it's the unit of, of, of absorbed radiation. Um, proton therapy, just so um, everyone knows, proton therapy is delivered in Warrenville. Um, Illinois, it is not delivered at Northwestern in the hospital. Um, it is in, War in Warrenville at a different location. But we do um, deliver electron, photons, and gamma, gamma rays. So what is radiation and what the heck does it do on the cells? So the radiation destroys cancer cells in localized area by disrupting the DNA synthesis. Small doses of radiation allow for normal cells to repair, thereby use, reducing toxicity. And then we also use the, the term fractionation. It just means dividing the total dose that the, the physician prescribes into fractions. 
Um, fractionation spares the normal tissues by allowing repair and repopulation of the healthy cells between fractions. So it decreases the toxicity basically on the normal tissue around the areas that we're treating. Radiation therapy takes place over multiple sessions because it's, it is more effective allowing the next fraction to target previously resistant cells. So some fun facts about radiation that I always tell our patients when we're doing our education. Um, you are not exposed to radiation while you are in the department or in the treatment rooms until the radiation beam is actually turned on. Um, that being said, radiation, when you are lying on the table, the beam is turned on for about two to three minutes tops. Um, it's a very short amount of treatment and dose that you, are, that you receive each day. Um, and that's the only time that you receive radiation unless you have radioactive seeds implanted in you. And that's more for prostate cancers and cervical cancers for women. Um, so unless, unless you have those in you, you are not radioactive when you leave the department. Um, you can be around pregnant women, pets, babies, you name it. Um, you do not have to urinate in a different toilet um, unless, you know, you're getting chemotherapy along with it. But just from radiation itself, you don't. And then, of course, I'm sorry, but you don't glow when you leave. So some roles of radiation. We have a curative role and a palliative role. Our curative role um, will be treating with a curative intent and that is where the disease has not spread beyond its um, primary location, and it's managed with aggressive doses and fractionation patterns that spare long-term effects, and the intent is to cure. So um, patients will typically receive anywhere from 20 to 44 treatments of radiation therapy when the intent is to cure. Um, when we are using radiation as a palliative mode, the palliative, um, form of radiation is used to shrink tumors that may be causing obstruction or organ dysfunction, and that radiation can help relieve the symptoms. So for an example, if a patient has metastatic disease that spread to the spinal cord and growing, and they have a spinal cord compression, we can treat that, um, that tumor in the spinal cord, decrease the compression, and use it for palliative, palliative reasons. Another, um, another one is like if there was if it was pressing on an organ, causing a lot of pain on a bone, um, radiation is probably the most effective pain management um, when it comes to treating tumors and cancer. So our care path, once referred to radiation, there's a few different steps that the patient has to go through before they actually start their treatment. So one, you'll come for the consultation, we'll talk, get to know each other. My name's Alexis, I'm gonna be your nurse. You'll meet with the physician, they'll go over the plan, you know, what their goals of treatment are. And once you guys have all decided together, yes, this is what I want to do, I'm going to move forward with it, then you'll come back for what we call a CT simulation. The CT simulation is a, essentially a, a CT scan, um, and we call it a planning session. And what it does is um, we make a, a, a mold of your body, either in what we call a VAC lock or in mobilization mask, and I have some pictures coming up. Um, and we put you in that every day for treatment. Um, and at the simulation, we simulate the position that you'll be in for all of your radiation therapy treatments. Um, the simulation, you will also possibly get little things that we call tattoos, which look just like freckles that the therapist will help line you up on. And the goal of every single treatment is to replicate the CT simulation picture and position that you are in. So we're simulating your treatment. After that, the photos or the pictures done in the CT go to the dosimetrist, the physicist, and the radiation oncologist. They plan where the beams enter and exit. They plan um, what, especially, you know, what, what tumor are they killing, you know, and making sure they're giving a specific dose to the tumor and um, decreasing dose to specific organs or tissue around you know the area that we're treating so once the plan is completely done it takes about a week after the ct simulation patients come back for their first treatment first treatment's the longest one about 30 minutes otherwise 10 to 15 minutes on and off the table pretty quick you're there for the x amount of um, fractions that the physician wants you know prescribed and then you're done and then we'll see you back in follow-up so I kind of went over this a bit. Once it's decided that the patient will undergo radiation therapy, they'll be scheduled for a CT simulation. 
That's where we're positioning the patient and then the mobilization that they'll be treated each day. And the CT therapists are looking to attain, attain the position that's well suited for the site of disease. Now here are some photos, um, all the way to the, lot, the left, the top left, this little bean bag looking thing is called the VACLOCK, V-A-C-C-L-O-C-K. And what it is, is it's like, it starts out like a big bean bag and you'll lay in it um, and it will actually mold and harden around your hips, around your feet, and then it'll stay that way. Um, this next one, these are examples of a mask that we use, a mobilization mask. This mask is put into a hot water bath. It becomes kind of nice and gooey, and then it stretches over your face and it's actually clipped into the radiation table. And I know that sounds really intimidating because it is, um, and some patients are, you know, claustrophobic with it, but you get used to it and it's actually pretty bearable. You can see through it, talk through it, smell through it, um, all of the above, and it does help with the claustrophobia of that. It's stretched around your face, so if you can see this bottom picture here, it's the mold of a, of a patient's face, and there's specific marks on the mask um, because we can't tattoo your face, like I was saying earlier. So the tattoos are given when the treatment will be um, either from like the, the sternum and below um, or the clavicle and below, and then the, the mask is made if we're treating like the head and neck area, the brain, and so on. And then this white mask is what we use. It's a little bit more specific for patients that are on steroids and we're able to space out the, that mask um, as needed throughout treatment if the face starts to grow a little bit from the steroids. So this is an example just very quickly of the dosimetry, what, they, what the dosimetrists make, the dose volume histograms are what they're called. And they can actually estimate the dose, you know, this patient is getting dosed to the brain or radiation to the brain, they can estimate the dose to the brain stem, to the right lens, to the left orbit. So um, they know that they are in a reasonable limit. And that's all you need to know from a dosimetry standpoint. It's pretty complicated. Um, this is our forms of radiation therapy. Um, and it's known as contouring with the dosimetrists do. So just briefly, we have our 3D form, our IMRT and our SBRT. Depending on the site, of, um, the site and size of disease and the disease involvement, the physician will use one of these three um, techniques to treat with radiation. So our scheduling, radiation scheduling is Monday through Friday. Our anesthesia cases are early in the morning. We do treat um, Lurie's Children's Pediatrics. So those anesthesia, anesthesia cases are at 7 a.m. Um, and usually last about depending on how many there are, but uh, until about nine or 9.30, and then the adult patients will start after that. We do have um, three different machines in the Galter Pavilion and two different machines in the Prentice um, Lower Concourse in the Pavilion. Unfortunately, we're in the basement because our, our walls are so heavy and made of lead, so we have to shut the doors and make sure no radiation you know, escapes out of those rooms. So we are in the basement of both of those pavilions. Um, so we do have five total machines plus a gamma knife machine. Um, while the patients do come Monday through Friday and have a certain time for every single treatment, and in this case you can see the patients treated at 12, 15 every day, we do, um, we do make room for, if, you know, you we're coordinating chemotherapy and someone has chemo, for instance, this patient came at 9.30, we can definitely make adjustments to your plans. Radiation is 15 minutes, like I said, easy to squeeze you in. Please never ever get anxious about if you have to change the timing with us. So some side effects. Um, side effects of radiation are very, very site specific. It depends on the site and the dose of the radiation. So the higher the dose and the larger the field, the more significant the side effects will be. It also depends on the chemotherapy agent that's being administered. And your chemo team and your medical oncology team will definitely go through the side effects and do chemo teaching with you um, prior to your first infusion. Um, and the side effects of chemotherapy is dependent on the drug being administered. So some supportive care. Um, chemotherapy and radiation use some similar supportive care measures to aid in side effects. So nutrition, if, if there's a lot of weight loss happening, um, we can do oral supplements. That'll be our first go-to. If patients lose 10% or more of their body weight, 
we um, kind of give them a bit of a nudge and say, you know, you got to get some weight back on or else we're going to put a G-tube in. Some patients are totally open to getting the G-tube and, and admit to needing the nutrition, nutritional support because it makes the biggest difference in, in your cancer care is, is making sure you're getting all that nutritional support. Um, another symptom management that we use are antiemetics. I'm sure that you guys have heard of Zofran or on Danstron before. That's a big one. Ativan, Compazine, um, and even sometimes dexamethasone can help with the nausea. Antidiarrheals, um, just over-the-counter Imodium works great. Analgesics, Tylenol, Ibuprofen, and then as we go on in radiation therapy, if you do develop pain, you know, we see you're there every day, we can see you and prescribe, you know, narcotics if needed. And then um, depending on if the counts drop from chemotherapy, um, blood products can be administered. This is a picture of our linear accelerator. Um, it's the radiation machine. These two arms here are what takes a generalized X-ray or CT scan that will lay over the CT simulation image every day. The machine goes around you, takes a picture. Once the therapists say perfect, they're in a complete perfect position, they'll go ahead and treat. Treatment is um, administered through this gantry. This is the Gamma Knife radio surgery treatment machine. This is our Mark's wall. Um, these are all of our pediatric cans that they sign with their name in their last day of treatment. And these are some pictures of all of us here at the department. And then our celebration gong that our patients hit on the last day. It's a real gong and it's real loud, it's fun. So thanks for letting me share the radiation um, standpoint with all of you and I'm happy to answer questions at the end of the presentation. Excellent, thanks so much, Alexis. Um, it's always interesting to learn what actually happens in the basement. Mm -hmm. So we do appreciate you sharing your insights tonight about the um, role of radiation oncology in many of our cancer patients' um, uh, treatment plans. Uh, so our next speaker who will be providing insights is Desiree West. And Desiree has worked at the Lurie Cancer Center in Northwestern Medicine for over seven years as both um, an inpatient oncology nurse and on, uh, outpatient oncology infusion nurse. And she is currently the lead infusion nurse for the Prentice Women's Health Infusion Clinic. And she, uh, her care specializes in the gynecologic oncology patients, um, as well as our breast cancer population. And uh, Desiree has her master's degree in nursing education and was recently the first Northwestern Medical Group uh, nurse to receive the DAISY Award for Extraordinary Nurses. And this is a really highly prestigious national honor um, that recognizes the superhuman work that nurses do for their patients and their families. So we are so excited to have you with us today, Desiree, if you wanna start sharing your screen and we will turn on your video. So um, as Kate explained, I work on the infusion side um, and I'm really happy that I was able to go after Alexis because we, we do work hand in hand um, with our patients going between radiation and infusion. And I really appreciated that she considered, um, you know, our patients, they are going through a journey and just remember, you are never going to go through that journey alone. You always have us here and, um, you know, there's a wealth of people who are available to support you. So please just always keep that in mind. So the objectives that I would like to touch on, um, I broke this down basically into three different categories. We'll talk about um, what to expect in the preparation for your first chemotherapy day. We will talk about the day of chemo and then just the few days post chemotherapy as well. So, um, I get several questions, actually quite a few from patients, and I thought those would probably be the most important things to touch on when um, giving you guys this talk today. Um, first of all, being a primary nurse here in infusion, I do work with one primary doctor, and that gives me the ability to touch base with all of my patients before they come back to infusion to receive their chemotherapy. Um, it allows me to establish a relationship with them. We sort of talk about the plan of what to expect and side effects and how their day um, will go through you know, their treatment cycle. 
Um, the biggest question that I always get, and I put this first, was am I able to take my regular medications that I'm prescribed, um, you know, my first day of chemo? A lot of patients, you know, are on a thyroid regulator um, or, you know, a blood thinner. And I always tell my patients, yes, it's fine to take your regularly prescribed medications. A lot of times we will give you some pre-medications, which we call our chemo prep, and it's okay to take those as instructed as well. Um, leading up to chemotherapy, I always tell patients it's so important to really hydrate yourself well and eat well um, for you know the weeks or days leading up to your chemotherapy. As Alexis mentioned, um, you know when we start seeing significant weight loss and drops in protein stores and fat stores, that can have a really negative effect on patients and your chemotherapy. So um, it's really important to maintain a really good hydration status as well as um, adequate nutrition. And I always let my patients know that we have nutritionists here that we can get in touch with. Um, and they have just a wealth of knowledge on you know, extra things that you can incorporate into your diet if you're struggling with protein or fat or carbs or if you have a restriction. Um, I also feel it's really important to sort of plan your space as well as um, your menu for the week. Um, you know, if you know that you're not going to feel good for the first three or four days after chemotherapy, try to make sure that you have a menu plan for the week. Get some groceries, have some things stored on hand. Um, if you have meals prepped, that's great. Um, I do have patients that tell me that their friends and family love to bring them food, which I think is always um, such a great thing. Um, you know, and it's very helpful, even if it's just to help feed like your loved ones that live with you um, and take the burden off of you of preparing a meal every night. Um, also, it's really great and okay to continue to exercise. Um, science actually proves to us that exercise is very, very beneficial in our oncology patients um, and can actually improve outcomes. So I tell my patients exercise as you feel don't push yourself, but you can certainly go out for a walk, a bike ride, anything that you feel okay doing at that time without overexerting yourself. Again, um, creating a comfortable home environment for yourself. If you know that you're not going to feel well over the next few days, maybe you want to prepare um, your bedroom in a certain way so that you have things around you. Or um, some of my elderly patients, they have a hard time getting up and down the stairs and they will make sure that their living space is set for them so that they don't have to go up and down the stairs 10 times a day to um, go to the bathroom or get something that they need. And they sort of set up their space around them for their own comfort um, and the needs that they have at that time. I think also with that being said, it's really important to create a space for yourself while you're here too. So I do tell patients, you can bring what I call a chemo bag. Um, if you have something that you wanna bring with you that's a comfort item, feel free to do that. Um, I have one patient that I think of in particular, every time she comes, she sets up um, her table with, she has some cards from her friends that have encouraging um, notes inside. She wears her favorite pair of Wonder Woman socks and she brings a blanket with her. So if those comfort items, um, you know, will be helpful to you, you can certainly do that. And if you create a bag to bring with you each time, I think that's a wonderful idea. Um, what I find to be most important is Obviously, this is a very stressful time. You're taking in a lot of information. A lot of that information is going to go right over your head. And I think if you can prepare a list of your questions or concerns that you can bring to your team while you're here so that you don't blank and forget all of the important things that you wanna ask, um, a lot of patients find that to be very, very beneficial to have that written out so that they can go through each concern and not worry about missing something that they feel is important. Also, I really think that one of the most um, beneficial things for patients when they're going through something like this um, is to have someone in your corner. If you can designate someone to be your spokesperson, someone that you trust to be your contact that can disseminate information to you, um, I think that's very helpful. Instead of having to send out 10 text messages to 10 separate people, maybe you have 
one person that you can send that message to that will relay all of that information to everybody else, sort of like um, a caring bridge. And that is also something that you can create, something that can be updated, sort of like a little personal blog. So that way you're not having to reiterate the same thing over and over and over again, which can be exhausting and it can be, um, you know, mentally exhausting as well. And then last thing, and I know this is hard, but try to get a good night's rest. You can take a Tylenol PM in the evening. Um, I actually tell patients to do this sometimes just because something so simple like that um, can bring you a good night's rest for a really important day that you have coming up. So the day of chemotherapy, um, I always tell my patients, please eat something for breakfast. You're going to be a ball of nerves. You're going to be hungry. Go ahead, have something for breakfast that is filling. Again, you can take your medications. Um, when you're considering what you're going to wear in chemo, this is silly, but oftentimes patients don't consider, I wore a really tight necked shirt and my port is in my chest and now I'm having a hard time exposing that. Or I wore all these layers and I am having a hard time, you know, rolling up my sleeves to have access for an IV. Um, that being said, if you can wear something that makes it a little easier for your nurse to either access a central line or place an IV, um, it's just something simple that, you know, can make it easier for you and your nurse as well. And with that being said, if you do wear a short sleeve shirt, um, I typically tell patients, go ahead and bring a blanket. It gets cold in our infusion clinic and we want you to be comfortable. Go ahead and bring snacks with you. You can eat and drink here. I think it's an excellent idea to have um, just a few easy snacks with you that you can snack on during your treatment. It might be a long day for you. Bring a water bottle. Um, and then also if you have, so generally outside of COVID, we allow our patients to have visitors in the infusion suite. Um, I. I feel it's essential to have someone to absorb that information while you're here um, and sort of just be a note taker. So if you have someone that you can bring with you, whether it be a spouse, a sibling, a friend, someone that you trust that can jot down the things that the nurse goes over, any questions that you discussed, someone that can just be that second um, set of ears to sort of take in everything from the day. And my caveat here, this is something that I discuss with my patients every, every new start because I feel it's one of the most important and vital things for me as a nurse to know about you. I wanna know what your goals of care are. I think it's absolutely essential that you establish them from the very beginning. They might change and that's fine. I wanna know what I can do to make you have the best experience that you can have but also um, do so in a way that's not taking away anything um, that you find enjoyable in life. So if, if what we're doing is taking away something that you enjoy, I wanna know that so that way I can tailor your care so that you're still having um, the best experiences that you can have. So during chemotherapy, um, Obviously, you're gonna come in, you're gonna have some labs drawn. You may have an MD visit with your physician in between having labs and coming back to the infusion suite for your chemotherapy. Um, something that I really like to explain because I think it gets overlooked. Um, your height and weight is very important each time you come in to have chemotherapy. So when you're prescribed a medication, Zofran. You get a four milligram tablet of Zofran. That doesn't change. Your height and weight doesn't really have much effect on that pill. When we make you chemotherapy, this is not a one-stop shop. It doesn't get pulled off the shelf. We are making it specifically for you. And when we do that, we do so by utilizing your height and weight to determine your body surface area. So if your height, obviously your height probably won't change. Um, but if your weight changes, that could potentially change the dose of your chemotherapy. So it's very important that we get an accurate height and weight on each patient when they come in. As silly as it sounds, a lot of people question this, like they don't understand the full importance of why we do that. Overall, um, chemotherapy has systemic effects on our body. 
and those effects are non-discriminatory. So what that means is that drug is affecting all of the most rapidly reproducing cells in your body. And when I explain this to patients, I try to do so in a way that makes the most sense. Chemotherapy, it's not smart. It doesn't know exactly what cell in the body to attack. It's going to attack all of those cells that turn over rapidly. So when this happens, that's why we see the systemic um, effects of chemotherapy. For example, we see hair loss because those cells are rapidly turning over. We may see GI irritation from the mouth all the way down um, to the other end because all of those cells that line our GI tract, again, are rapidly turning over cells. They can affect respiratory, GU, um, pretty much every system except for neurological um, tends to be affected in some way from chemotherapy. And again, that's why we get the very um, broad side effects from, from these drugs. Um, like I said, certain cells are more vulnerable to chemotherapy. Um, and I think one of the most important things that I like to um, tell my patients when, when we're sitting here and I'm giving you chemotherapy, I'm going to tell you if you start feeling funny or different or anything other than how you feel when you first walk in the door, tell your nurse right away. Even if you think it's something insignificant, it could potentially be the start of um, you know, an allergic reaction or a reaction to the drug, which is important for us nurses to know so that we can manage it. And then at any point, always ask questions. No question is a silly question. If it's brewing in your mind and you are thinking it, go ahead and ask. And just for the few days after chemotherapy, typically, you know, patients go home and they feel okay the first day, the second day. We've given you some pre-meds that kind of keep any like nausea or um, side effects at bay. But by day three or four, you start maybe feeling a little punky. So I really like to explain that it's okay to keep what I call like an at-home kit handy. Um, we will prescribe you anti-nausea medications to take as needed. But there are some over-the-counter medications that... Um, come in, you know, very handy. And I think it's always safe to keep these things, um, you know, at home. Uh, I, I explained that the use of stool softeners is okay. A lot of these anti-nausea medications um, can cause constipation. So I would say either a Miralax or Colace, Senna, something um, that you can utilize to um, sort of combat constipation. On the other end, a lot of times we have patients that experience um, diarrhea, and this sort of goes hand in hand um, with radiation therapy as well, which Alexis did mention. You can use over-the-counter Lamotil. It's always safe to have an over-the-counter indigestion medicine at home, which would be something like Pepsid, and over-the-counter allergy medicine, Benadryl, Claritin. In the event that you go home and you have a delayed reaction to a drug, you have that on hand just in case. Obviously, if it's an emergency, you would go to the emergency room. And finally, the most important thing, know how to contact your primary care team and know when to call them. So when we send you home with your paperwork, we always mention on there, this is how you can get a hold of us. This is the phone number to the cancer center. A lot of our patients now like to utilize my chart. Um, if you send us a message, someone will get back to you. Um, um, but just know how you can get a hold of your team and who is on your team. So that way, you know, if you're trying to send a message to somebody, you know who you're looking for. Um, if you call in and you are trying to leave a message with your team, um, you can go, you, you're able to do that. And I think actually that's it. So if there are any questions, I will try my best to answer them. Thank you so much, Desiree. It's Kate again. And um, we'll be taking questions in the Q&A box. Um, and then hopefully after our next presentation, we'll have some a uh, few minutes left um, to review any questions that are posed. But Desiree, thank you so much for talking about the infusion aspect of um, the, the cancer treatment, um, given that so many of our patients are um, experiencing this. So we really appreciate your time and your expertise, and we look forward to talking with you in a few minutes um, during the Q&A session. 
So um, if you'll stop sharing your screen, great. Our final presenter is Stephanie Bradley. And Stephanie is a board certified family nurse uh, practitioner who specializes in gastrointestinal oncology at the Lurie Cancer Center. And Stephanie completed her Bachelor of Science degree in nursing at Indiana Wesleyan University, and then earned her Master of Science degree at Governor's State University. She holds a national board certification with the American Nurses Credentialing Center as a family nurse practitioner. And she is also an active member of the Advanced, Practice, Advanced Practitioner Society for Hematology and Oncology and Oncology Nursing Society. Stephanie, that's a lot of words all put together. So um, we are so impressed by your credentials and so very thankful that you can um, share your expertise with us tonight. So if you wanna go ahead. Good morning, everyone. My name is Stephanie Bradley. I am a nurse practitioner within the Robert H. Lurie Comprehensive Cancer Center. Um, I work in GI oncology, and today I will be talking to you guys about what to expect when you're expecting cancer treatment. I have nothing to disclose. So our learning objectives for today. Um, throughout this presentation, my goals are to describe the basics of chemotherapy, describe the different types of cancer drug treatment, understand the difference between adjuvant and neoadjuvant chemotherapy, explain the most common toxicities associated with cytotoxic agents, and also to kind of discuss what to expect the first day when receiving chemotherapy. So what is chemotherapy? Chemotherapy is a drug treatment used to kill rapidly dividing cells. If you notice, I um, did not say a specific cell, I said rapidly dividing cells. Chemotherapy is used as a form of treatment in the fight against various types of cancers. Um, chemotherapy is systemic, meaning it travels throughout the body. Um, and because of this, this can impact healthy cells within the body. So inside of our bodies, we have cells that are supposed to naturally rapidly divide. And when we introduce chemotherapy into that equation, not only are the cancer cells impacted, but our normal cells are also impacted. And because of that, we can develop different side effects. So that's where you can sometimes see hair loss, you can see skin conditions, you can see um, decreases in your blood counts, um, nausea and vomiting and things like that. And we'll get more into those uh, toxicities later on in the presentation. How is chemotherapy used? So we use chemotherapy for a number of reasons, right? So of course, chemotherapy is used to with the intent to cure cancer. We also use chemotherapy um, to control disease, to make sure, um, to try to make sure the disease is not spreading to other organs and other sites within the body. We also use chemotherapy to palliate symptoms. So if you're having uncontrolled side effects from, some, from cancer, chemotherapy can be used to help with that. So we have cure, we have control, and we have palliation. So what is neoadjuvant? Um, you may hear the term from your care team, we are recommending that you go through neoadjuvant treatment. So neoadjuvant chemotherapy um, is used to help um, decrease tumor size and to increase the likelihood of complete surgical resection. So sometimes um, your oncologist may say, we need to give you chemotherapy before the surgery to help shrink the tumor. So that will increase the chances of us um, having a successful complete resection during your surgical procedure. 
Um, what happens is you'll go through a certain number of sessions of chemotherapy. There will probably be diagnostic imaging to measure the size of the disease, and then you will proceed to surgery. What is adjuvant chemotherapy? So adjuvant treatment um, is given after the removal of a tumor. So you may um, present what a surgical oncologist and go through your entire surgical procedure. And then they may tell you, you know, based on the pathology, we want you to discuss this with your medical oncologist, but we might need to give you chemotherapy after the surgery um, to eliminate micro metastatic tumor deposits and to decrease the risk of tumor recurrence. So after chemotherapy, um, the medical oncologist will sit down with you and look at the pathology report and they'll look at different um, results on this report. And if there are like unfavorable uh, things on your pathology report, that will probably make the medical oncologist be more inclined to then recommend or prescribe adjuvant chemotherapy. So common toxicities associated with chemotherapy. So toxicities is a fancy word for side effects. So because um, we are interrupting the body's natural replication cycle, there can be side effects associated with chemotherapy. Unfortunately, we cannot predict which ones you will have. Um, we are all unique. We are all made differently. So because of that, I, or anyone for that matter, won't be able to say, well, hey, you will experience these. So these are all probable. Nothing is definite, right? So these side effects are generic. There are side effects that are specific for certain medications. Um, and your medical um, oncology team will be able to give you more insight if there are uh, drug-related side effects that they need to discuss with you. Um, these are a few of the generic side effects that can happen with pretty much any cytotoxic uh, chemotherapy drug. So myelosuppression, um, that is a term used to describe suppression in your bone marrow. So inside of your bone marrow, your red blood cell, white blood cell, and platelet counts are made. And we'll talk about that next. Nausea and vomiting um, is a common side effect associated with chemotherapy. Constipation, diarrhea, alopecia, which is, which is hair loss, mucositis, um, which is a term that's used to describe uh, mouth sores, and fatigue. So myelosuppression, um, again, as I was just describing, your platelets, white blood cell count, and red blood cell um, are all made in your bone marrow. And all of these cells rapidly divide. So because of that, and again, chemotherapy is systemic. So when we um, enter, when chemotherapy enters into your body, it goes throughout your entire body. It doesn't just go to the tumor, it goes everywhere within your body um, through the venous tract. So when you look at these cells, you have your platelets, your white blood cells, and your red blood cells. So what are platelets? Platelets are responsible for clotting. So if I were to cut you on your hand, you will start to bleed. You apply pressure and then you'll notice that you magically stop ble bleeding. That is because of platelets. Platelets come to the site, stops the bleeding, you get a scab, you get a scar, and you're fine. Um, platelets are made in the bone marrow and chemotherapy attacks things that rapidly divides. So your platelets can drop. Um, and you can imagine if your platelets are low, you can be at an increased risk for bleeding. So what we see sometimes is we see patients who blood count, the uh, platelet count has dropped and they notice that they just softly rubbed up against the surface, but now they have a pretty extensive bruise. That can happen because of the platelets. Or they notice that they're brushing their teeth and their gums are bleeding more than they normally would. That could be because of a low platelet count. Um, so what we do is when you come for chemotherapy, we check your blood cell counts every time you come because we have to ensure that you're at a, at a safe place where we can administer the chemotherapy. Um, how can we correct that, right? Uh, we can correct that 
the first thing that we normally do is time because they rapidly divide and over time the chemotherapy is out of your system, your platelet counts will recover on their own. If we notice that they're not recovering and you're at a critical level, um, which is typically less than 10,000, then we will do a platelet transfusion where you would go and you will actually receive an infusion of platelets. So what is the white blood cell? The white blood cell is responsible for fighting off infection. And there are many um, white blood cells. There are many white cells that make up the total white blood cell. There is one particular white blood cell that we as clinicians, we really pay attention to, and that's called the absolute neutrophil count. So the absolute neutrophil count is uh, the cell, the white blood cell that we look at when we're making a decision if we're gonna move forward with chemotherapy. So what happens is we get the report back and if the number is not at a certain level, then of course we can't proceed with chemotherapy. However, because your white blood cell count is low, you're at an increased risk for infection. So we go over what we call infection precautions and we talk to the patient about, you know, not entering crowds, avoiding sick people, making sure that they are washing all of their fresh fruits and vegetables, um, that they are also checking their temperature and monitoring to see if they have a temperature or not. Another thing that we can do in anticipation for this is we can administer a white blood cell booster shot. So we can give you an injection that will increase your white blood cells. And some of the chemotherapy regimens, we know that they are very, very, very um, high risk for what we call neutropenia, which is a decrease in the absolute neutrophil count. Um, so we do that ahead of time and we just do it automatically. Sometimes we find that some regimens that we didn't feel we would need to do it, over time we end up having to then add that white blood cell booster to that regimen. Um, but the key takeaway is that you can be at an increased risk for infection. So you wanna make sure that you are protecting yourself if you're told that your absolute neutrophil count is low. Finally, we have the red blood cell count. So when you look at the red blood cells, um, there are a few red blood cell counts on a CBC. However, the one that we pay the closest attention to is the hemoglobin. So hemoglobin is responsible for transporting oxygen throughout your body. So if your hemoglobin is low, you can imagine that one could feel tired, they could get like short of breath really easily. So we really look at this number when we're giving chemotherapy because we know that chemotherapy can bring it further down. So we monitor it. And if it got to a point where it's too low, we could do a, a blood transfusion where we would give you red blood cells or we sometimes use a red blood cell booster injection. So nausea and vomiting. So there are a few different um, types of nausea and vomiting that we have encountered when someone is going through chemotherapy treatment. So you have the acute nausea and vomiting, the one that starts less than 24 hours after you have chemotherapy. Um, and sometimes we will give um, intravenous anti-nausea medications that should cover you for 72 hours. However, sometimes they're not as effective and we have seen where there is an acute phase of nausea and vomiting. So what we do is uh, we give you prescriptions for supportive medication, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Then there's the delayed nausea and vomiting that typically happens between 48 and 72 hours after the chemotherapy. And then unfortunately, um, some of our patients have experienced anticipatory nausea and vomiting. So they came in that first time and they unfortunately experienced a lot of nausea and vomiting and now they associate the entire experience with that. So they kind of anticipate having that. Um, there's also breakthrough nausea and vomiting where despite whatever you take, you still have nausea. 
And then we have refractory nausea and vomiting that's sometimes um, unresponsive to treatment. And that's a little bit more um, high alert where we have to admit someone because as you can imagine, if you're vomiting, you can lose a lot of electrolytes and you um, can also have fluid imbalances. And we will have to bring someone into the hospital so we can correct that and also try um, a series of intravenous medications to kind of get that nausea and vomiting under control. So the next side effects, uh, we have constipation and or diarrhea. So constipation and or diarrhea can be, it's a very common side effect of many of the chemotherapy drugs, <laughs> excuse me. Um, any over-the-counter medication can be used to mitigate these side effects. I get questions all the time like, well, um, I'm constipated. Is it okay if I use colates? So any over-the-counter medication for constipation and diarrhea can be used to help these side effects. And we actually prefer that you start with the ones that are over-the-counter first. Um, before we escalate to prescriptive medications. So there are prescriptive medications that um, your medical oncology team can prescribe to help if these side effects are uncontrolled. So alopecia, which is hair loss. So most hair follicles are in the growing phase. Um, and because we introduce chemotherapy, you can see a variation of hair loss. So you can have where it's shedding, where you brush your hair and you're seeing more come into the brush or you're washing your hair and you kind of see it in the shower. Um, you see more hair loss with that, where it kind of gets thin and it's shedding. Um, there are some agents that can cause complete hair loss where all of your hair fall out. Um, and this can be hair anywhere. So this could be your eyelashes, this can be your eyebrows, this could be hair on your legs and your arms, your pubic hair, this could be hair in any area. Um, and then there's sometimes where hair can kind of fall out in different patches. So some uh, patients just opt out to say, you know what, I'm just gonna cut it all off myself. Um, other patients are like, okay, I'll just go through the entire process. It typically happens seven to 14 days after chemotherapy. Um, normally the second cycle is when it really escalates um, if it's going to happen. Um, however, the good thing about it is, is that it does return. Your hair will come back once treatment is completed. So after a couple of months, you will see that your hair is coming back. However, it could be different than what it was before. I have seen where um, hair has come back where you probably had straight fine hair and now you have curly hair. Or you probably were um, a darker color and now you have a lighter color. So it can definitely change and be different from um, the way it was before. But the takeaway is, it does return. Mucositis. So mouth sores. Um, unfortunately, with chemotherapy, the way we come up with the dose is based on a person's height and their weight. It doesn't take into consideration prior comorbidities, any health issues you may have had. Um, it doesn't take that into consideration. You get your height, you get your weight, and you get a magic number, and then we administer that. However, that chemotherapy number may be a little bit too much. And we've been able to determine that because we see mouth sores. And typically mouth sores is an indication that um, a chemotherapy agent is too strong. And what we have to do is we have to then kind of lower the dose so you don't develop mouth sores. Because a couple of things can happen with mouth sores. You can get a really bad infection in your mouth. Um, and of course, if you have sores in your mouth, you're uncomfortable. You don't want to eat or drink. Um, and that could lead to weight loss and dehydration. So we really like to stay away from mouth sores and we really like to get them under control excuse me, as soon as possible. 
So if we see someone develops mouth sores, that typically lets us know that we need to make some changes to the dosing. In addition to that, for the immediate symptoms, we prescribe magic mouthwash, oral gels. Um, we could also prescribe, if it looks like it's kind of infected, um, Nystatin mouthwash, which is like an um, antifungal mouthwash. We also prescribe pain medication because again, this can be painful. Um, we recommend uh, avoiding any type of alcohol-based mouth rinse. So um, Listerine and those type of mouthwash are definite no, you don't want to use those. We um, can prescribe one that has like baking soda, um, lidocaine, and Benadryl. And those ingredients help to numb the area. It helps to promote healing. And it also allows you to eat and drink which is what is most important. What to expect on the first day of chemotherapy? So the first day of chemotherapy can be very scary and intimidating. Um, you don't really know what's going to happen to you. Um, so how can I help to describe some of the things that you may be asked to do? So of course you have to sign a consent form. We have to make sure that you understand the side effects, that you understand why we're doing what we're doing. So with you signing that chemotherapy consent, that lets us know that you acknowledge that you've been educated and you understand what's happening. Um, there will be a series of education happening. Um, you will start getting education from the provider that you see, and that may be a nurse practitioner, physician assistant, or medical oncologist. Um, sometimes there is a pharmacist who's into the fold, where the pharmacist will then provide further education about these different side effects. And then, of course, when you're in the infusion suite with the nurses, they will also be providing education, too. Um, we also go over medication reconciliation and counseling. So we look at any of the medications that you're currently taking. Let's say, for example, you're taking amlodipine for high blood pressure we, or a diabetic medication like metformin. We look at all of these different medications and we reconcile and we do counseling based on that. Because unfortunately, some of our treatments can exacerbate current um, uh, medical conditions. So we need to know what you're on and know how to try titrate things if we need to. So we'll also do the counseling on the support of medication. So um, your medical team, medical oncology team may decide to prescribe you um, anti-nausea meds, uh, which we typically do undanzatron and compazine that Sofran and Procloperazine. And we counsel you regarding those medications. We give you information on when you should take it, how you should take it, um, and so on and so forth. Sometimes we also prescribe um, a steroid to help with nausea and vomiting as well. The other thing is we suggest that you bring someone with you that first day. It's always good to have a second set of eyes and ears because it's a lot of information that we give out on the first day of chemotherapy. We talk about how to report side effects, which is very important. If you're experiencing any side effect at home that is not controlled, that's not a message that you want to send through a um, message via my chart or email. You want to be able to call so typically um, at our cancer center, we have an on-call number. We have someone who is always on call to field those calls when they come in. And you want to call because if you send a message, someone may not see that message for hours or until the next day. And if it's on a weekend, it could be for a couple of days. So you want to make sure that you call and you talk to someone about those side effects. And of course, if you're not getting a response in a timely fashion, always err on the side of caution and proceed to the emergency room. If you're having uncontrolled diarrhea or vomiting, or you have a temperature of 104 or greater that doesn't seem to be responding to Tylenol or something like that, and you've called um, and no one has gotten back to you, always err on the side of caution and proceed to the nearest emergency room. 
Um, we also make sure we uh, talk about the layers of support that we have. We give you information about the team. So at our cancer center, we have a, a robust supportive oncology program where we have dietitians, we have social workers, we have a palliative, um, palliative medical oncology team as well. So we introduce you also to those services if you will need those. Um, so basically that pretty much sums up my presentation. Um, I always recommend writing your questions down if you have any before you come that day, whatever questions you have, if you think about them, jot them down, because when you come on that first day, you may be so overwhelmed that you kind of forget it. Um, journaling is very good too. It'll help you kind of get an idea of what your side effects are. And one more thing that I would like to add before I conclude, chemotherapy is cumulative in nature. So as you progress through cycles, you can imagine that if you had a certain side effect at cycle two, that side effect could definitely be worse at cycle four. So as I'm explaining that to say that if you're having these side effects and you know that you have them, you wanna be proactive in managing them. So if you know that you have nausea typically day four after the chemotherapy treatment, you may wanna take the nausea medications uh, prophylactically just to stay on top of it and to better control it. Um, so again, that concludes my presentation. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to send those in. Um, I appreciate your time. Have a great day. Well, again, we're coming up on the end of our evening. So I wanted to um, thank uh, Stephanie, Alexis, and Desiree again for sharing your insights and um, answering a few questions. Um, and thank you all attendees for sharing a portion of your evening with us at the first ever virtual uh, Cancer Connections. And we are actually doing part two on Saturday morning. So hopefully um, you will join us then. And um, that session, you'll learn about uh, palliative care and oncology, the benefits of the yoga practice to take care of both the mind and the physical body. And you'll receive a live cooking demonstration from one of our dietitians. Um, and she'll provide some recipes for you to take away uh, for healthy plant-based meals. Um, so on behalf of the Valerie Cancer Center and um, my whole team, um, we are so grateful that you're able to uh, spend the evening with us. And we thank you and we wish you well and we hope that you stay safe and healthy. Thanks so much and have a good evening.